Well, good evening, good evening. We'll go ahead and get started, get set up. Yeah, the fan's blowing on me. It's good. I like that fan. Even after the air conditioner gets fixed, I may keep that fan up here. Uh, well, good evening, good evening. Thank you for coming out. If I'm glowing a little extra red, and obviously I'm not, not dressed the way I normally would dress to be behind the pulpit, but thanks to Fred, everything that could have went wrong went wrong. <laughs> no, Fred so graciously uh, lent us his truck with the gooseneck set up so we could move the fireworks stand, and Jesse came over and helped, and Carter pin broke on one side of the... Uh, Jack, and so I was having to limp it along, and the gooseneck, it's that pulled the pin, but the ball itself was stuck, I mean stuck, 30 minutes of beating from underneath and above, and gear oil and everything else, and we finally got it out, and it was about 6.30, and they were still talking about, I'm like, guys, it's 30 minutes till church, we got to go, we need to wash up, because we all smell like donkeys, and so... Anyhow, this is, I just, this is a miracle. I went from donkey to decent in just a few minutes. So anyway, but thank you all for coming out tonight, and we'll get into midweek uh, study. I'm excited about this. Uh, kind of a teaching, uh, just to kind of walk through some things. Uh, did a, uh, unintentionally did a little bit of vision casting over the weekend, uh, just kind of worked its way out in the sermon and some questions were asked, and I thought, well, you know, I think there may have been some questions asked because there's some misunderstanding of Scripture. There's misunderstanding in uh, maybe what was actually said. And so this isn't the preacher beating anybody up from the pulpit. This is the preacher realizing there needed to be some teaching. And so uh, just kind of went to the Lord in prayer over the last few days and have got this teaching together. Uh, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 28, looking through verses 18 and 20, which is the Great Commission, and uh, kind of define exactly what the Great Commission is and, and what it is in making disciples. Sunday night, I talked about being a disciple to those who were had, that were getting baptized because they need to understand. You've asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, and now you're making this outward profession of your faith that you're burying the old man, and you're raising in a newness of Christ, and you're committing yourself to the Lord. And so you need to understand what it is to be a disciple. Well, maybe we as the church need to understand a little better what it is to make a disciple. Rather not just being a disciple, but it's a two-sided thing. As I'm not only a disciple unto the Lord, and I'm a disciple unto my mentor, my pastor. Everybody needs a pastor. You, you, you always got to have, a, the pastor needs a pastor, and the pastor's pastor needs a pastor. We, we got to have a pastor. And so, um, not only am I being discipled, but then I'm in turn commanded to make disciples. And so the thing is true with you as well. You are to be discipled from the Lord, the Holy Spirit, me, your pastor, and others in the church who are in places of teaching. But then you are in turn to share the good news gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and hurting world and in turn bring people alongside you and disciple people as well. So we may understand what it means to be a disciple, but tonight I want to talk about making disciples. And in talking about making disciples, that will help us move forward in the vision and the call of God that he has placed on our life and our church. And so this evening's teaching, if I was having to label it, I called it moving forward. What it takes in moving forward to be who God has called us to be. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening. Father, we come before you and we give you glory and honor. Lord, we worship you and we thank you for an opportunity to just come before you. Father, tonight I ask that you would empty me of myself Send the teacher and preacher, O oh God, help me to declare your word, rightly to invite it, to clearly articulate it. Anoint those in the sanctuary, anoint those who are watching and listening now and later. Anoint them to receive the word, to not just hear it, but to do it. 
And so, Father, tonight I pray that you would knit our hearts together in unity. Let us hear from the throne room of heaven that we may go forth and possess the land in which you have called us to. Father, for those who are sick, we believe for a healing in their body. You have told us to ask, and it shall be done. You have told us to pray the prayer of faith, and the sick will be saved. And tonight, Lord, by faith, we ask you, minister to the sick, heal their bodies. For those who are bound, flood their eyes with light that they may see, Lord God, making the, the spirit breaks the yoke, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so, Father, we just ask that you come and have your way in this place, and we give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, again is the Great Commission. I pulled from here Sunday night, but um, I really want to point out and look at verse 19 mainly. But 28 verse 18 then Jesus came and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you and remember I am with you always even until the end of the age amen and so we need to just understand first off before I go any further I want you to know as a born again again believer that Jesus is with you always he is with you if you are submitting yourself to him if you are being a true doer of the word you have a promise from the Lord that he's not going to leave you nor forsake you he's right there with you and through the power of the baptism in the Holy Spirit we will have the evidence and the ability to go forth and witness and testify that the spirit what the spirit has put in us bringing to our remembrance the word of God that we hide in our heart and we read given us a boldness to declare the truth even when the truth is not popular and so Jesus is with us and if we really have a true revelation that Jesus is with us you could just nearly clear any fence or any hurdle or any task that's before you can't make a brick wall thick enough to hold you back when you realize you got Jesus with you my great-grandmother she always would say you talk to her you'd say well nanny I'll, I'll see you Sunday Lord willing, Lord willing, Nanny, what, what are we doing tomorrow? Uh, Mama told us we're riding a school bus to your house. What are we doing when we get there? Lord willing, we're going to go down to the bio. Lord willing, I need to go pick up them tomatoes. Lord willing, I need you all to go collect them. It was always that the Lord was willing. If the Lord was willing, well, look, if Jesus is with me and I'm doing his word, he's a willing. He's a willing. And if Jesus says so, the answer is yes. And so... Who can say no? But tonight I want to talk to you primarily on making disciples. And forgive me for drinking water. I am not replenished yet. If I was true holiness, I wouldn't have a mustache to catch water in my beard. Anyhow, I'll leave that alone. That's what I tell Allie every time her makeup runs. If you was true Pentecost, you wouldn't have to worry about that. <laughs> See, this command, this command, it applies to everybody. This really isn't even a suggestion. I said it right. It's a command. The Lord says, go. Not would you. If you feel like it, maybe, if it's available, if it fits your schedule, no, go. Go into all the world and make disciples. We get caught up on the evangelism side. Is evangelism important? Absolutely. If you don't get people saved, you can't disciple them. But we think just because we've went out and converted a bunch of people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that we've accomplished all there is to do. We know you just started. That's step one. The command of God is to make disciples, to make a disciple. So what is, what is disciple? Well, the Greek word that is here, that's really a Greek phrase that is translated in make disciples. And now I want to say it and I can't. Mothatulsate, it's a big word. And when you break it down and you look at it, it means a learner. To tr a learner. A learner. Someone who is learning. 
It also means not only are you learning, but it has that twofold. You as a disciple, you are a learner who trains and develops someone else in the truth of the Scripture. You yourself train and develop in the truth of the Scripture and the lifestyle that it requires. That was a caveat of that definition in the Strongs that I really enjoyed. Is it's a lot, whole lot more than just hearing the Word and showing up to Sunday school. No, it is to understand a truth of the Scripture and that there is a lifestyle. There is, there is things that you ought to be doing and there are things you ought not to be doing because you are a disciple of Christ. There are some rules and regulation in Christianity. And I know people don't like to hear that, especially in 20. 2022 but listen we need to realize we're not to look like the rest of the world we shouldn't sound like talk like I'm thankful that the word sanctification is something that we use in our language I, I use it a lot it's a word that I you know I've told you about Cooper when he needed to be baptized the second time and I said son why why? You're seven years old. You've already been baptized once. Why do you need to be baptized again? It's not to go play, and you ain't going swimming in the baptistry. I know, Daddy, but I ain't sanctified enough. Yeah, let's get to the baptistry, and we're going to dunk you again. I ain't sanctified enough. Is that a thought that we have as Christians? Are we really gauging our sanctification? Are we gauging our life against the Word of God and what He's calling us to do? Or do we just go through the motions, bouncing to and fro one storm to the next, never really checking up to see if we're being who God called us to be? See, I'm talking about making disciples tonight, but before we make a disciple, we got to be able to make disciples. You've got to be qualified. I always loved it when I was in the construction world, a contractor, you'd go into somebody's house and you was in there remodeling their kitchen or bathroom and you'd run into a little problem and you'd scratch your head trying to figure it out, the most cost effective but the right way to do it. And then the person who hired you to do it who hadn't ever even held a wrench in their hand or a saw in their hand, they want to walk in there and look over your shoulder and tell you how to fix it. You know, and I'm like, I know you're writing a check for this project, but I kind of wish you'd shut up and get out of my way because that's the reason you hired me to do this because you can't. You know, well, we do that in Christendom. We want to tell everybody else how to live for God all the while we're not doing it ourselves. What level are you holding yourself to? See, not only is there a lifestyle required but we need to be pointing people to Christ in every aspect of life. When you train somebody on the job, train them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When you talk to somebody in the grocery store, understand that you ought to be walking after the Spirit and not the flesh and that God can use that moment as a divine appointment to teach and minister and to share the good news gospel to somebody. We as Christians really don't have the privilege of to just numb skull walk through life. We ought to be on mission all the time. To be a disciple, it also means to follow his precepts and his instructions. That is, Jesus' precepts and his instructions. James 1.22 tells us that if we are just hearing the word but not doing it, that we've only deceived ourselves. So quite frankly, it doesn't matter how much scripture you can quote. If you're not doing it, you're wasting breath. <laughs> I was reading over James this morning and I of course come across this verse that I had planned in teaching and was reading some of the notes and commentary on it and a thought popped in my mind and I wrote it in my my notes here <laughs> I thought about writing some commentaries but wouldn't nobody read it because they'd be too mean because I had the thought ever devil in hell knows the word of God but the thing is that they don't do it so if you're not being the true doer of the word, 
you've got as much right as a devil in hell to speak in somebody else's life. You don't have any. Because the devil knows the word. We know he knows the word. He uses out of context to Jesus. So knowing the word and doing the word are two different things. They were talking about making disciples. We got to train people, not just read your Bible in the morning and in the night. Don't just memorize some good memory verses, but start applying those things to your life and actually be a doer of the word. The only way you can move forward in what God has called you to do as an individual, the only way we can move forward to do what God's called us to do as a corporate body are to be doers of the word in every aspect of of our lives. This command to make disciples of all nations. We're demanded, commanded to go into all the world, everywhere. We like that, go into all the world. And so we will focus on all of our world missions. I think we support 17 or 18 missionaries here at the church. And then I know many of us as individuals support even others beyond that. We get excited to send money to somebody to Africa. And there's nothing wrong with that. But then we can't tell the guy at the oil changing place that Jesus loves us. You know. The little girl that got your order right at the restaurant. Did you remind her that it's okay? Because Jesus loves her and you can tell she's having a bad day. Or do we lose our cool and throw our cheeseburger across the counter and walk out without paying at all with leaving no tip or anything. And then get real proud to send $50 to Africa. I know it's the Wednesday night crowd. I can't teach stuff like this on Sunday. People wouldn't come to church here. I had to wait my Wednesday night crowd. Y'all can handle it. Too bad half of them's on vacation this week. But are we taking it serious, the whole command of the Word of God, in being a disciple? In making disciples, go into all the world, all nations, but don't forget across the street either. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all the things that Jesus has commanded. That's something that the church in 2022 really needs to get a hold of. Teaching all the things Jesus has commanded. Not just what makes you feel good. Not just what makes you popular. Not what just gives everybody all the tinglies and the fuzzies. Not just the scriptures that allow sin to be rampant in your church and people can come back week after week not knowing that they're living in sin because you've never preached against it. Because you're not teaching people to observe all the commands that Jesus has given us. We want to cherry pick the word of God. The primary purpose of the commission is making disciples. Christ, of course, again says he'll be with us until the end of the age. But there's really a promise in there. He's with you until the end of the age, those who are making disciples. So those who are doers of the word, those who are being obedient followers... Through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is with us always. And he is at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. So two questions come to my mind. I'm going to ask them to you, and then I hope I can help you answer them. Two questions in the Great Commission when I read this to go into all the world making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to deserve all the things that I've commanded you to do for lo, I'll be with you always until the ends of this age. Amen. And so question number one is well how do we grow? How do we grow the kingdom of God? How do we grow the body of Christ? How do we do it? 
Question two is really question one reworded. How do we really do the Great Commission? How do you do it? It's easy to say go and do it. It's easy to tell people to do it. But how? How do we do this? How do you do the Great Commission? Well, in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11, Paul writes, he says, He gives some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of services and for the building up of the body of Christ. So how do you build up the body of Christ? It takes all of us. It takes all giftings. And it takes all of us doing what God's called us to do. I preached to you Sunday morning about knowing what God's called you to do. And, and to hear him. To hear him. So now I'm, I'm asking you, then how do we do these things? Well, look, it takes all of us. There is a five-fold ministry. It takes all five at work in the body of Christ, doing what they are supposed to do. For the equipping, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, and for the building up of the body of Christ. I'm reading out of the MEV, the modern English version. I'm sure our slides are King James, so if there's a little bit of wordage difference. Until we all come into the unity, verse 13, until we come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a complete man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It says, unto a perfect man in the King James Completion, till we become a complete man, until we have come to the unity of faith. Well, how do we come to the unity of faith? Well, the, you got to back up to verse 11. He gives some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers for the equipping of the saint, for the equipping of the saints. See, there are people called to ministry to equip the saints, the perfecting of the saints. There are teachers in this church who's got to be allowed to teach. There's pastors in this church who's got to be allowed to pastor. There's evangelists who need to be allowed to evangelize. There's prophets that need to allow to, be, to prophesy. And there is the apostolic function that must function. In order for us to move forward and fully grow the kingdom of God according to the word of God. To really move forward in the vision and the understanding of the word of God. Verse 14 says, So we may no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about with every wind of doctrine by trickery of men and craftiness with deceitful scheming. We see this so often in the church. People chase every fad. This, this year it's this fad. Next year it's that fad. And, and I'm just going to be real honest. I understand that having good days and bad days. We all have them. But if your life goes from mountaintop to valley bottom in the matter of just a week or two and it makes this rotation ten times a year, there's something out of balance. Because this is not how God is calling us to live our lives. We're being tossed back and forth to and fro. Am I telling you that you shouldn't be upset when something bad happens? No, I'm not telling you that. But my faith shouldn't be doing this. Sometimes I have to stop and think. I'm like, man, that come out of nowhere. And about the time you want to go plunge into the bottom, the Holy Spirit should be speaking to you and saying, yeah, but remember, I'm with you always. Don't forget that I'm your provider. Don't, don't, don't you forget the promise I've given you and encouraging you and it pick you up before you hit bottom. But you've got to have somebody that you can call on. 
you got to have one of those teachers, one of those pastors, one of those evangelists, prophets, or, or apostle to call on, to help you, to equip you, to remind you sometimes of the Word of God. Having each other. Because maybe you just need to be teaching your fellow man. You might not have a quote-unquote class. You might not have a platform. But you can teach each other the Word of God as you talk things out, discuss things, encourage one another, lift each other up. See, it takes all of us to keep this thing moving forward. I said it in the, I guess introduction that here just this this last week in the last few days I've I've had some things questioned and and I wrestled with it for a little bit and how to address it because I'm not I'm not mad I'm really not even shook by it but I've learned something that if one or two people feel something strong enough that they'll come to you and vocalize it, well, nobody's actually vocalized it to me, but, you know, you vocalize it to somebody else who you know will vocalize it to you, then it's like, well, maybe then there's other people who have these same questions and concerns. Maybe, maybe this is a, a, a thought that's running around, and so the only way you fix that is talk about it. Well, what's the most effective way for the preacher to talk to the people? what I'm doing right now because y'all don't want to come up here on Thursday and let me preach to y'all over again do you but I am I'm just going to be open and honest for a few minutes and and encourage you is my goal in this there have been questions about some of the vision that I cast Sunday I made mention of multi-site but I believe that that is a vision the Lord has given Allie and I years ago for our ministry. And the Lord has called us here, and we don't doubt that. We, we are, as far as we're concerned, we're here. We ain't going nowhere. I done bought a house. I went to district council this week, and I heard the preacher say something in a joking form, and I felt a nudge of the Holy Ghost, and so I'm going to do something. Y'all ready for this? I'm going to go buy two burial plots right here in Atlanta why because I'm here either Jesus is going to return or they're going to plant me here but I'm just going to go ahead and by faith I'm just going to go ahead and just buy two burial plots so y'all tell me later which one's the best funeral home I mean best uh, uh, great cemetery what's the prettiest one I want a pretty grassy knoll so Jesus can find me easy when he calls me up but I'm believing he comes back sooner than that. But no, I mentioned being multi-site. I'm not talking about going out next week and opening up 10 churches. I'm not talking about, you know, trying to conquer the region. No, I'm talking about spreading the new good news gospel of Jesus. I'm talking about there are towns in our section that used to have Assembly of God churches that don't have them anymore. We're no rich church, but we ain't doing half bad either. And I believe that if you sow your seed in the right ground that you're going to reap a greater harvest. And so... I'm talking about as the Lord leads and opens up doors that we move forward. But without vision, a people perish. So we've got to know what to be praying about. God, open these doors. God, if this is your vision for Cornerstone, then show us how to move forward in these things. That's what I'm asking and talking about in casting vision. Not that I'm going next week and going to mortgage the church and buy seven. Steve said, I know you ain't because I'm a deacon and I ain't signing off on it. <laughs> uh, that's not what I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about taking the resources not only of money, but the resources of people and going throughout our region and planting the Word of God where there is nobody planting a Pentecostal message. I'm not even talking about traditional church. We're going to have to get out of some traditional thinking and growing the church in 2022. And when I say tradition, I ain't talking about the Word of God. I'm talking about thinking that we got to do church, you know, 10, 30, and 6, and 7, and you got to have this, and you got to have... How about we just preach the Word of God, and we preach it whatever day and whatever time somebody will show up? No, I can't pastor this church and one in Lone Star on Sunday morning at the same time. But I can go over there on Saturday afternoon and preach one. I can send somebody over there and do a 2 o'clock service on Sunday. Give somebody the Sunday night service here every once in a while and I go over there at 2 o'clock and preach one on Sunday. We can do a Tuesday night Bible study in Clarksville. That's what I'm talking about. Why can't Sister Katie go preach? Huh? She says, I don't want to. Don't you point me out like that. She's the retired preacher in the house. We just bring her out of retirement. Let her go preach somewhere. Huh? I don't really know if you retire. You just kind of step out of the pulpit for a little while. I mean, Charles Hell preaches three funerals a week right next door. Why can't he go? You, you know what I'm saying? I'm, you don't have to be me. I don't have to be me standing in a pulpit. I'm not the only one that knows the Word of God and is anointed to declare the Word. Not if I'm doing my job right. If I'm really making disciples, then they ought to know. You ought to know the Word. That's what I'm talking about. That's where I want to offer clarification but I am going to defend something and I'm not going to apologize for it to call multi-site unscriptural is proof of biblical ignorance and I won't soften that you just don't know the word of God to call church a multi-site church unscriptural that's foolishness just what it is And I'm going to teach that here in just a second and make it plain what the first century New Testament church looked like. We get caught up on what we think 2022 ought to look like. How about let's go back to what it was in the basics. Let's do it the way Jesus did it. Let's do it the way the Apostle Paul did it. Because if you say Paul was unscriptural, how in the round world did he write two-thirds of the New Testament? That's called dumb. That's what that's called. Preacher, be nice. I ain't going to do it. I ain't going to do it. If you don't get in line with my vision, that is your opinion and your... That's fine. It don't hurt my feelings. You come to me and say, Pastor, I just... I can't get on board. With what you're doing, I'm going to leave. I'm going to say, God love you, God bless you, and I pray wherever you go, the Lord use you mightily. You come to me and tell me what I said is unbiblical, I'm going to call you a fool and teach you just exactly how little you know. And that's where I am tonight. Because it's not unbiblical. It's not unbiblical. I'm going to say it the third time. It's not unbiblical. Because here's the thing, and I'm preaching to you who's in this sanctuary. When God gives you vision, when God puts a call on your life, Lola calling those women on Tuesday for Women of Wisdom Bible study, that's a call of God. James and Lola together getting game nights together on Friday, it might not be preaching of the word, but it's breaking of the bread and fellowship together, bringing unity amongst the people. That's a call of God. I hear about Sister Lorraine on her lunch breaks calling some of the women in the church and talking to them. That's a call of God. That's checking in. That's helping keep tabs on people, praying for each other, lifting them up. That's a call. That's a ministry. 
See, we often think ministry is just what I'm doing right now. No, what's God called you to do? Huh? Ministry's Fred bringing that one ton up here with that gooseneck and us getting that doggone thing moved around here to sell fireworks. <sighs> Me or him one wasn't praying right or all them carter pins wouldn't have broken. All the <sighs> them long-winded jacks. <laughs> they just crank, crank, crank. It's like, is this going anywhere? <sighs> we talked about losing weight, brother. Maybe that's just the way the Holy Ghost did it. That's ministry. That's ministry. Ephesians 4 verses 11 through 13 that we've walked through, they suggest that all five leadership ministry gifts are still continued and essential for today. All five of them. The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. I'm going to teach for just a second here because I know that I'm casting vision that's different than what it's been in the past. I know that I do church a little different than what it's been done in the past. I know that. But what I'm doing is not unbiblical. Here's what I think, or here's where I'm certain. I'll just be real bold with you. The misunderstanding is, is all five of these leadership ministry gifts must be in operation to bring the entire body of Christ to the level of maturity that is described in verse 13, coming together in a unity of faith, a completion in the body, a mature faith. You've got to have all five. You've got to have somebody teaching people at a basic level, here's what the Word of God says. You've got to have a pastor that is coming alongside and patting them on the back and nudging them. You've got to have the evangelist that's reminding people that first we must see the lost saved. You've got to have the prophet stand up and say, here are two extremes that are wrong. We need to bring them to the middle and get back to the Word of God. And you must have the apostolic function. And here's where I believe lots of misunderstanding is, is people don't understand the apostolic function within the church. I ain't talking about a business card and a job title calling somebody apostle or something like that. I ain't talking about that. What I'm talking about is the function of the apostolic leadership. Apostolic leadership are visionaries. Apostolic leadership pioneer ministry. They are not designed to just sit around and go with the status quo. Apostolic function is not to sit back and just do what somebody else has done. Apostolic function is to get in the presence of God, hear a fresh rhema word from the Lord, and say, look, I know that you've been walking down Main Street for the past 50 years, but Main Street ain't fit no more because everybody's taking Highway 59. So we got to move this thing. I'm not saying we're moving the church. I'm just using an example here. Is there anything wrong with walking down Main Street? Uh uh. Can you get where you're going walking down Main Street? Uh huh. But what's your job to reach people? Where's the people? 59. So why are you arguing with me? Because I said take 59. The Bible just said take a road and reach people. And yeah, you've been doing it on Main Street for 50 years. But the Holy Ghost gives the apostolic function a nudge and say, won't you go to 59? Because like, you know, everybody's on 59. It's vision. It's different. It's pine. But we hadn't done it that way before. But does it follow the word of God? Well, yeah, there's nothing scriptural about it. We've just not done it that way before. Ding, ding, ding. Welcome welcome to pioneering. Welcome to starting things. I've started a few businesses. Do you know the day after I started businesses, I did things that I hadn't done before? Because the day before that, I didn't own the business. Men didn't come to my shop and get in trucks and pull trailers to job sites on Monday because I didn't own a business. 
But then Thursday, a crew shows up and ready to go build a bathroom. Because on Tuesday, I decided we're doing this thing. And we're starting tomorrow. So on Thursday, I did things different than I did Monday. Did I do anything wrong on Thursday? No. It's I didn't have a business. I pioneered something in between Monday and Thursday. So you got to do things a little differently. So I believe where some of the confusion is coming is there is apostolic function in our church today. There is pioneering vision in our church today. And we're just moving forward. It's got nothing to do with me building me. Who am I? I'm a dumb hick from Foreman, Arkansas. That's who I am. I'm just a fat, bald-headed country boy from Little River County. Ain't nothing special about me. Other than I know in whom God has called me to be. And there's not very many things I'm certain or confident about in life other than that one thing. I know that I know that I know that God called me to declare his word. I know that God called my family to serve in this church. I see a vision for this church that we will look back in 30 years and say, Do you remember when... Because if it is the will of God and done according to the word of God, it don't matter who the main preacher is because they come and go. It is a living organism that will be structured to continue to function no matter who's driving the cart. You've seen those license plates that says, Jesus is my co-pilot. Those things burn me up. Jesus ought not be your co-pilot. Jesus ought to be the pilot. He ought to be the pilot and you just sitting over there in that jump seat and you get to take charge sometimes when he sets it on autopilot. You still ain't flying it. He just lets you think you are. Cooper been driving. He'll sit in my lap. He can't reach the gas or the brake. And he's driving. But what he don't see is my hand down here on the bottom of the steering wheel still correcting it when he kind of gets a little bit too far. But boy, he's happy because he's driving. You know, to me, that's a perfect picture of what should be us and the power of God. Is daddy lets us sit in his lap and grab hold of the steering wheel but we ain't going to go no faster than he's mashing the gas. And when it's time to stop, he has full authority to slam that brake. And when he needs to, he can yank that wheel and put us right back where we need to be because we're starting to veer too far one way or the other. But boy, we feel good while we're doing it. In dealing with apostolic function, I want to say this, and then I'm I'm going to move on. With the first century apostle, the apostle Paul, and others like him, there is a uniqueness to their office and their function. They saw Jesus, like literally saw Jesus. And the authority to write scripture, that's what sets them apart from a modern day apostle. Because we ain't writing scripture no more. The scripture has been wrote. The canon is closed. And everything we do must line up with the word of God. But as far as the function and leading church, pioneering ministry, developing and training leaders, that's still a function that's needed in the church today. See, it's, it's not... Good enough for me because this is a call on my life. It is not good enough to have a church full of people that's just a church full of people. I want to raise up preachers and teachers and evangelists and send them out. That is one of the greatest joys in my life is when I get those phone calls. 
I told you all about Hunter Leonard, who's one of my youth at Louisville, who's now surrendered to the ministry, going through Chi Alpha up in Knoxville, has been over to Egypt, is getting ready to go back to Egypt, and, and, and the Lord is doing some things through his missionary endeavors, and, and he calls, and he says, Brother Richard, I got a question. I'm just be very honest with you. My pride, a good pride, holy pride, holy pride. Boy, how did it goes way up. Because to think, you know what? All them years of them stinking hot dogs and nachos and Oreos, all those years of building the slip and slide kickball field and my big rear end getting out there and slipping and sliding with these kids, bouncing around on a balloon, acting goofy with them. Y'all can't picture the old stuck, just sticking the mud preacher doing it. I did when I was in youth ministry. That's what I had to do, keep those kids' attention. Sometimes I wondered if I wasn't failing miserably because, you know, we are eating and playing and having a good time. There's a lot of laughing and joking, but are they taking any of this to heart? I asked myself that question lots of times. But now when they call and say, well, brother, I've surrendered to the ministry. I'm on my way to Egypt as an AG missionary. Just let me die and go on to glory right now. Praise God. You know, when the presbyter calls you, when I wasn't even at an AG church, when I was at the church in Sims, it wasn't AG. I was AG credentialed, but my church wasn't AG. But the AG presbyter's calling me. And saying, hey, do you have some preachers that you can send? I got three empty churches, and most of the churches around here ain't even got enough people to do what they need to do. Ain't nobody got extras, but somebody said, you got some extras. Sure do. How many you need? Where do you need them? Well, can you spare them? Well, if the Lord's calling them, then yeah, I got to spare them. And I'll just have to raise somebody up to take their position. That's who God called me to be. So I can't apologize for that. I'm not going to apologize for that. If you don't want a church that's raising up leaders, I'm sorry. You go to a church that's about to start raising up leaders. It brings me joy that Wyatt is getting words from the Lord and is burdened to preach. I mean, I'm having to, you know, slow him up a little bit. He's ready for me to get out the pulpit and let him preach every Sunday morning. I'm like, look, brother, I love you. But I'm still behind this. There's still a senior in front of that pastor. And so you're going to have to just wait your turn little 16-year-old kid. But I'm glad that there's an excitement in him. I'm glad that Micah is grabbing folks in the altar and believing God and interceding with them in a heart to burn and disciple and lead. That makes me proud. That's what this is about. And we'll stay the course and stay with those young men and, and develop them and believe God with them. And the first time a pulpit comes open, you better believe I'll be the biggest cheerleader to get them in that pulpit. And I believe it's easier to be a cheerleader when you got the pulpit yourself. So then people start saying, well, you're just trying to build your, your brand. You're just trying to control everything. Well, see, that's because they don't understand an apostolic function. And that's what I'm going to teach on here. See, I'm, I'm, like I've said, I'm nobody special. I'm just me. Just Richard T. That's who God called me to be. Just that plain and simple. But when you know who you are, don't back down from it and don't apologize for it. I'm saying this to you. When you know who God's called you to be, be that person. And don't apologize for it. I used to really struggle with that. Because it can be taken as arrogance. Confidence, lots of time, is confused for arrogance. I understand my heart. I'm scared to death of displeasing God. Quite frankly, that's why I'm sometimes as rough as I am. Because I'd rather hurt your feelings today and please God than to make you feel good and have to stand before an angry God. But Paul never backed down from who he was. He never apologized about it. He was who he was. Well, how do you know that? Well, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called and set apart of God. 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, called to be an apostle through the will of God. 2 Corinthians 1.2, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not from man, or through men, 
but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the command of God our Savior. 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Titus 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. In Philippians and in First and Second Thessalonians, they all three say, I'm Paul, a servant of God. He didn't back down from it. He didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't apologize for who God called him to be. Every time he wrote a letter, in the very first, first few words, here is who I am. And in Galatians, he had to get clear with them. And don't you, and I'm not called by no men. No, I am who I am because God called me and I'm not going to apologize for it. And he goes on and defends his call more. But I'm not talking about defending a call. I'm talking more about knowing who you are and not apologizing from it. While I pastor this church, Cornerstone, we will raise up new leaders and we're going to send them out. We're going to launch new ministries. And nowhere in Scripture does it say that I'm to stop training them. See, that's where we get messed up too. Oh, well, he's got his own church now. You need to keep your nose out of his business. Well, not when I pastored him for 10 years. I'm the one who told him the position was open. Sent him over there. And not me. He still calls and asks. Because that's Cade over at Delwood. Hey, here's something I got going on at the church. Uh, I need your opinion on this. What do I do? Am I all knowing? No. Am I no more than he does? <laughs> Just because I've walked this longer. <laughs> He's smarter than I am naturally. He's a genius. 23 years old, graduating in August with the Masters of Divinity. Blows my mind. When I was 23 years old, I wasn't worried about worshiping Jesus too much. Well, at 23 I was, but 19, 20, and 21 I wasn't. But I raised him up. I, not I as in a haughty mind, but I was his pastor. I am his pastor. I never stopped being his pastor. While he has a congregation that he is pastoring, I'm still his pastor. Because just as I have a pastor, he needs a pastor. As I've already said, everybody needs a pastor. You never don't need a pastor. I don't dictate what happens at his church. But I pour into a lot of it because I'm his pastor and he is wise and he seeks counsel. You don't think I hadn't sought counsel for what I do and decisions I make? Well, if you were wondering, I do quite frequently. I'm not saying this just because some of his folks are in here, but during COVID and trying to work through that whole ordeal and mess Brian McDonald helped me out a whole bunch I'm like what in the world am I supposed to do I'm in uncharted waters here what are you doing when the judge threatened to arrest me I called him brother <laughs> the county judge just said he's sending deputies to my church tonight and if I'm there I'm going to jail he says well what did God tell you to do well, God told me to be at the church. He said, well, then be at the church, but call the judge and tell him you're going to be there. Well, that's gutsy. Don't do anything behind his back. Don't you sneak. Be open and honest because God's open and honest. So I picked up the phone. I called the judge. Hey, I needed to let you know I'm having church. Well, I thought I was, I know you said it. And he talked about who he answered to or something. I said, I understand, but the thing is, is I answer to God. And he's a lot higher than you are. And I'm going to church. Well, obviously I didn't get arrested. And obviously we did what God called us to do. 
but it was under the pastorship, leadership, mentorship of a pastor who had walked that road longer than I had, who gave me wisdom, who says, look, you got to do what God's telling you to do, but you be open and honest about it. Don't do anything behind the scenes. It was a weird Sunday night when the Lord just kind of dropped in my spirit that we needed to go to faith. I'm like, I ain't been to faith in like years. I mean, I got married in faith. That's where Allie and I, we just used the church. We didn't go to church there, but that's where we got married. Like, it's been years since I'd been to faith. And just as I'm talking to you, the Lord told me, go to faith. But God, we don't have church on Sunday night, and I like not having church on Sunday night because I mowed my yard after I got through with church today, and I'm about to go take a shower. I'm going to kick back. Allie and the kids are already kicked back. It's to go to faith. So then I knew he meant business. So I went in the house. I told Allie, I said, get the kids together. We're going to church. Oh, babe, do we have to? I said, no, like for real, like get ready. We got to? I said, yes, we have to. Well, where are we going? Faith. Faith? Yeah, we're going to faith. Why? I was mowing. The Lord said, go to faith. I'm in here. I'm going to shower. We're going to faith. Call Cade. Tell him to get dressed. We'll pick him up on the way. We're going to faith. That's what she did. And we went. And I sat through the service. And it was a decent service. But I didn't have the Shekinah glory of God appear before me. No rhema word descended down on my head. And I was walked out of the church thinking... Okay, God, I mean, I came to faith. I could have been taking a nap. I mean, I was blessed and all, but I mean, I was really expecting, you know, to hear something from you. And about that time, I'm opening the trunk and putting my Bible in the truck, and Brother Brian steps out under the portico and says, Brother Wade! Yes, sir, what you doing? We're headed to the house. Y'all got plans for dinner? No, sir. Well, stay and eat with me. Well, I got my wife and kids. That's fine. I also got my associate pastor. It's fine. He can come. Okay. So we went over to the fellowship hall. We're sitting around the table eating and talking. Now, I hadn't told you this portion of this story, but two months prior to that, the Lord had told me, prepare for transition. What does that mean? I just kept it under my hat and prayed on it. Two weeks later, Allie come to me. She says, I felt the Lord's really instructing me that we should prepare for a change. I said, well, two weeks ago, he told me to prepare for transition. What does that mean? I don't know. We better pray. So we're praying. Now, here we are at faith. Nothing happened. But now Brother Brian's invited us to dinner. So we're sitting here and we're talking. And he looks at me, just looks up, just mid-bite and looks at me. How long have you been in Sims? A little over three years. Where well, you staying or are you leaving? Blood drains out of my face. I said, uh, I'm praying. He said, have you considered Atlanta? I said, what's in Atlanta? Cornerstone. That's how all this come about. I was mowing my yard, and the Lord said, go to faith. And I went to faith, and Brian McDonald looked and said, have you considered Cornerstone? Here we are two years later. When the Lord calls, he makes it plain. Don't apologize for what he's called you to do. So here's what I want to talk to you just a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm closing. This is my first close. So, you know, there's two to follow. See, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus are all pastoral letters from the Apostle Paul to these young men whom he has mentored and has done ministry with. He writes them to encourage them. He writes them to remind them of some spiritual issues. He refers to them as spiritual sons. And he's telling them what they need to be doing in their churches. So I'm answering the question of building a brand or trying to be in control of everything. No, in the apostolic function, there's way things work. 
when you raise up leaders and then you send leaders out. You don't dictate them, but you still pour into their lives. There is a big difference in pouring into somebody's life and dictating what they do. So he pours in to these young men, even though they're now pastoring their own church. Paul still moves them around as the Lord instructs him to do. And so during Paul's second visit to Lystra, he invited Timothy to join him on a missionary journey. And then Timothy, he helped take the message of Christ throughout Macedonia and Achaia and was with Paul for most of his missionary journey and ministry in Ephesus. And Timothy traveled with Paul probably all the way to Jerusalem, but we're not exactly sure, but probably. And then from Jerusalem... He was with Paul. He went to Rome. Paul was in prison for the first time in Rome, and Timothy hung around with him for a while during the first imprisonment. After Paul was released, Timothy continued to travel with Paul, and he went with uh, Paul to Rome, and then Paul went west from Rome and went to Spain, and then he uh, returned to Crete. And while at Crete, he commissioned Timothy to be his representative to the ministry and to deal with some issues that was going on at Ephesus. And from Ephesus, he goes on to Macedonia. And then while in Macedonia, I'm sorry, not from Ephesus, from Crete, Paul goes to Macedonia. While he's in Macedonia, he commissions Titus to handle some issues on the Isle of Crete. So he was at Crete, and he left Crete and goes to Macedonia, hits up with Titus and says, matter of fact, you need to go back to Crete and address some issues there. Them people need some more preaching, but I got other things I got to do. So you head back to Crete and take care of these issues. And then Titus, under Paul's ministry, starts several churches, multiple sites. And then Titus serves as a representative of Paul to the church at Corinth at least once we can find in Scripture. Do you hear what I'm saying? Representative of who? Paul. Paul was the man in charge. Paul didn't even found these churches. People who got saved under Paul's ministry founded these churches. But Paul was respected by the people and the leadership of the church as a spiritual authority. And so they allowed him to speak into their lives. And so Paul's like, I can't go, but Titus, you go. I can't, Timothy, you go. Oh, well, Titus, you're back from Crete and you planted those seven or eight churches. Well, great. Now I need you to go to Corinth and handle a situation over there too. And then Paul, he left Titus in Crete, he goes to Macedonia, and he writes the letter to Titus to encourage him to complete his task. Do what I've told you to do. Do what God has instructed us to do. Remember the vision? Remember that we've been believing God for? Remember that that we've been praying for? Remember that that we believe God has empowered us to do? You stay the course. Y'all heard that before? Stay the course. You complete the task. Don't you give up. Don't you stop. I know things are hard. I know it's difficult. I know you're frustrated. But you stay the course and you finish what God called us to do. But not only did Paul write this letter to Titus to encourage him to complete the task, Paul sent the letter by um, Zenos and Apollos, two others who were under Paul's direction. And while they traveled through Crete, and the letter that Paul wrote to Titus but sent to two other people in another town and another island where Paul wasn't even at, it says, look, I'm going to send either Artemis or Tychaeus to you to replace you because, Titus, I need you to join me here in Greece. And then we know in Scripture that Paul later reassigns Titus to Dalmatia. And so... To say multiple churches under the leadership of one apostolic function 
overseeing multiple ministers and telling them what church to go to and where to move around is unbiblical, quite frankly proves that you ain't never read the New Testament. Because that that I just shared with you is one man, the Apostle Paul, raising up about 15 preachers, sending them throughout multiple countries, planting who knows how many churches, and will write a letter and say, I know you're there, but I need you here. I'm sending such and such to replace you. So when he shows up, you head this way. And then after he got there, we read on later on that there was some point in time, we don't know the exact year, he says, all right, I've done all, you've done what I needed you to do here, now I need you to go there. What it is, is it's a misunderstanding of the apostolic function in the modern church. Because what it is, is people get greedy and they want all the control. To be apostolic function means you've got to be able to be trustworthy, number one. Because you can't get 10 or 15 leaders to follow you if they don't trust you. But if they trust you and they've seen you live for God, again, I'm nobody special. But I promise you the reason Cade Rich will go to bat for me, (laughs) if somebody had a gun to my head and said, Who can we call that we know will stand in front of this gun? I ain't going to call my wife. I'm going to call Cade. Because when he is ready to quit, I made countless trips to Tulsa to encourage him, don't quit school. Stay the course. There was a lot of semesters. He called me. I don't know how I'm going to pay for this. I trust God. God's been good. He's been faithful. But mom and dad have given me all the money that they can. There's, it's a private school. I can't get FAFSA. I, I, I'm short. How much? $2,500. Are you coming home? Over Christmas break? Yeah. Well, come see me. I could do that then because I had a business. I can't do that now, so I don't have no plans in mind. (laughs) But there's been multiple semesters that I believed in the call of God on his life enough that I could write a $2,000 check. I could write a $500 check. I could write a $1,500 check and make sure that his school bill was met. There's been times he's seen people just turn completely ugly. And instead of punching them in the teeth, which is what my flesh wanted to do, stand there and say, well, I hate you feel that way, but God love you. Can I pray for you? And when it's all said and done with, he said, man, I was ready to punch them in the mouth. For you to be able to do that, I know the anointing was there. I said, yeah, brother, because my flesh was wanting to punch them in the mouth too. Preacher, don't say that kind of stuff. Well, hey, there's moments. You ain't heard some of the stuff people say to a preacher. But saying what I'm doing is unbiblical is about one of the worst insults anybody's ever given me. And I won't stand by the side and just allow it to go out there. I'm addressing it. And I ain't pulling no punches. And here it is. To say it is ignorance. And I'll be even further. If there's others that feel it's unbiblical, you're ignorant too. And you need to learn the word of God and get out the way. Because we're moving forward. And we're going to do what God's called us to do. We're going to do it under the inspiration of the Spirit. We're going to do it through the leading and the guiding of the word of God. And we're not going to walk through any doors until the Lord opens one. But when the Lord opens it, we're going to walk through it. I understand that there's even natural questions. What about people? What about money? I got them same questions. (laughs) Let's ask each other them same questions. Because I don't know. But it's not faith if we have all the answers. 
If we can figure it out in our understanding, we're not operating by faith. Sometimes you got to step out saying, well, I ain't too sure, but Jesus said do it. Because that's how Peter walked on water. I have some more scripture, but I feel like I probably ought to be about done. It's summer break. My wife won't be ready to take kids to bed, so I guess I got a few more minutes. I just want to read some scripture to you. I'm not going to preach. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, So you, my son, be strong in grace that is in Christ Jesus. Share the things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses with faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Endure the hard times as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. No soldier on active duty entangles himself with civilian affairs that he may please the enlisting officer. Anyone who competes as an athlete is not rewarded without complete, competing legally. The farmer who labors should be the first to partake of the crops. Consider what I am saying, and may the Lord grant you understanding in all things. So here is the Apostle Paul writing a spiritual son of his, and he's saying, look, it's going to be hard, but keep on. Don't let nobody tell you you don't deserve to reap from the harvest that you're sowing because the farmer ought to be the first person to reap from the harvest that he has sown. So don't apologize for any benefit that you might receive in doing the Word of God. Run your race, run it well, and don't cheat. Be a person of integrity. That's me paraphrasing, but that is what Paul is telling Timothy there. In Titus chapter 1, Verse 5 says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city. Multiple sites. You know why Titus had to set elders in every city? Because there was a church in every city on the island of Crete under the apostleship of Paul, led by his under-apostle Titus, preached by the elders that was the set aside by Timothy or by uh, Titus. So Paul himself didn't even pick the elders. Paul sent Titus, his under-apostle, to set up elders in every church to pastor all them different churches, them multiple sites. Talking about things being unscriptural. Verse 6. Any man who is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children who are not accused of being wild or unruly. I'm struggling there. I mean, he's only seven, but he is pretty unruly sometimes. Verse 7, for an overseer must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not easily angered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not greedy for dishonest gain, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, self-controlled, just, holy, temperate, holding firmly to the trustworthy word that is in accordance with the teaching that he may be able to both exhort with sound doctrine and to convince those who oppose it. And so when you talk about an overseer, when you talk about a pastor, what some things we ought to see in these people? Well, number one, they ought to be people of integrity. That sums up most of those things. If you lie, if you cheat, if you can't be trusted, well, you're already disqualified. But the last end of verse 9 there, to be able to not only exhort with sound doctrine, you got to know the Word. And not just what the page says, you got to be able to dissect it in proper context. you got to know the Word. Not just spout off at the mouth and prove how ignorant you are. 
And you've got to be able to convince those who oppose it. So what does that teach us? There's going to be people who oppose sound doctrine. But you better be able to stand up and say, shut up, you're wrong, and here's why you're wrong. That's what the Word of God says. See, you didn't know this, but you're in the middle of discipleship making right now. See, you don't just hear the Word, you're going to learn how to do it. You're going to learn what it's really saying. You're going to learn to not apologize for being obedient to God, but to walk worthy of the call in which He has called you to. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and 8. It says, Remember those who rule over you and who have proclaimed to you the word of God. Follow their faith and considering the results it produces in their lives. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I said I wasn't going to preach, and I'm sorry, forgive me. I didn't mean to tell a story. Here's something I want to point out, and it burns me up. And this ain't got nothing to do with what was said here recently. This is just something that really rubs me the wrong way because Christians can be real bad about it. Verse 7, remember those who rule over you. I don't really like that word rule because I'm not here to rule over anybody. I'm here to love you and to point you to Jesus and train you in the word of God. But look, remember those who rule over you, who have proclaimed the word of God to you. Follow their faith and consider the results it has produced in their lives. So look at my life. Judge my life and see what my faith has produced. And let that be a judge of whether you follow or don't follow. Because I'll say it this way. It burns me up. People want to stand up and correct somebody and you look at their life and it's in total chaos. What has your faith produced? I ain't talking about hardships. I ain't talking about hard times. We all go through those. It ain't never easy. I'm talking about sin. I'm talking about foolishness. I said it to somebody the other day. Here we're talking, we were talking about some things. If you've smoked, cracked, or cheated on your spouse in the last three months, don't come to me trying to tell me how to do something. You hear me? Let I ain't even just making that statement. Put that in your calendar and remember it forever. Don't ever walk in the pastor's office and try to tell me nothing. And you ain't been 90 days without habitual sin. Because you can't. You couldn't tell my dog what to do. And I'll just be real honest with you. Judge what other people are saying. I know preachers who, oh, they can preach it. Boy, they preach it good. They put on the show good but their household is falling apart. Having big ministry, small ministry, that don't matter to me. I'm talking about having healthy ministry. Preacher been preaching somewhere 20 years and he's got less people than he started with and the church is falling apart. There's a problem. Take notice because his faith ain't producing in his life what I want produced in my life. I want growth. I want advancement. I want to be better in five years than I am today. It ain't about riches and money. But if the preacher can't pay his bills, if finances are in disorder all around him, might ought to check up and look at something. Because faith ain't producing something that should have been produced. Does my checkbook get low? <laughs> my checkbook gets empty sometimes. <laughs> low would indicate that there was still something in it. But praise God, by faith, <laughs> and the goodness and the obedience of the Lord... About the time I'm ready to plug my nose because the ship is going under. But when the God comes along and picks the sail back up and you carry on a little farther. 
Judge, you heard me say that word right. Judge what the faith of people is producing in their own life. And let that be a guide as to how much you allow them to speak into your life. Because if what they sow in don't do nothing but reap mess, then whatever they're going to sow into your life is going to reap mess there too. You better start looking for the pretty garden and ask them how they do it. You ain't never pulled into somebody's yard that had a beautiful rose bush that you barely could see through all the thickets and say, how do you grow rose bushes? No, it's when you drive by Joanne Hale's yard and there ain't a single grass blade out of order because she's been out there with a pair of scissors the day before after Charles has mowed it three times this week, clipping them ex. Sister Joanne, how'd you plant that? That's who I'm asking because that's how I want my flower bed to look. But I ain't. But then she says, well, you got to get out here. You got to see these little scissors. You got to get down here. Oh, well, then never mind. I can't round up, you know. <laughs> now, round up don't work on my yard. You got to get out there with scissors. Oh, well, maybe one day. Hmm. I know what I've said is hard. And I know you might be thinking, I thought you said you aren't mad. I'm not mad. Maybe hurt or offended is the proper word to label something unbiblical that couldn't be more a picture of the first century church than anything I've ever seen before in my life. So much so that through prayer, I knew it had to be addressed. So remember those who rule over you, who have proclaimed to you the word of God, follow their faith and consider the results it has produced in their life. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what... what I believe Paul is saying here in Hebrews, there's debate about that, but what he is saying is Jesus don't change. He's the same. And so if he promised it yesterday and they live by faith and they reap from it yesterday, you can reap from it for today and you can reap from it tomorrow. Jesus don't change. Look at their life, judge their faith, see what it's produced, follow them if it's producing what you, if you like what you see, follow them because Jesus can do it for you too. First Peter chapter 5, verse 1. I exhort, the, I exhort the elders, let me get that out right, who are among you, as one who is also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, as well as a partaker of the glory that shall be received. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Take care of them, not by constraint, but willingly, nor for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Do not lord over those in your charge, but be an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that will not fade away. Likewise, you younger ones, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another and clothe yourself with humility because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Cast your care upon him because he cares for you. Be sober and watchful because your adversary the devil walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him firmly in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Resist the devil. He is there and he is seeking whom he may devour. Go before the Lord. Find yourself in his presence. Hear a rhema word from God and don't let nobody change your mind. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I love you. God loves you. I really do love you. And I, I, I don't like correcting things. I really don't. But when I have to, I will. I wish, I wish Randy Hillis was here because it's been several months ago.
there was some stuff going on on the sound team, the worship team. Yan yan behind the scenes. I don't know if Tracy was on the worship team by then or not. And Allie asked me, she goes, what are you going to do about that? I said, babe, we're just going to pray about it. What are you going to do about it? I said, we're just going to pray about it. We're just going to pray about it. I don't know. I didn't want to address it. But then finally it festered. One Sunday morning, why well, has got to do that on Sunday morning? But Sunday morning, I'm getting ready to preach, and it festered ugly about 9 a.m. So I walked in here. I ran the kids out. I shut the door, and I told them, here's how the cow's going to eat the cabbage. I will have church today without a worship team. I will stand up here and lead these people from the piano and a cappella out the hymn book with no slideshow before I allow foolishness. You don't like a preacher that tells the worship team what to do? Then you need to find another church because this preacher is going to do it because I'm the pastor. And what I say goes, especially for this worship team. Afterwards, Randy come to me with a smile on his face. He said, I've been doubting that you had it in you to correct things that needed to be corrected. But boy, I, wouldn't, I can't be more proud that you're my pastor than this morning. <laughs> so a preacher don't like correcting. I don't. But multi-site, making disciples, and producing leaders is not unscriptural it is the New Testament structure and I'm not looking to build anything for myself because whether we got this one location or five locations I don't see where my paycheck changes any because we'll be taking everything from those locations pouring it back into those locations this isn't a pyramid scheme let me see how many I can get under my pocket. I'll skim a little off the top of everybody. No, that's not how this works. So we're moving forward. And I want you to move forward with me. And I know that God is more than able. And quite frankly, I'm plumb excited to see what the future holds for Cornerstone. Atlanta and all the cornerstones to come wherever the Lord wills that they shall be God's good I've got a call scheduled for 10 a.m. in the morning with Mike Harper from the district office to go ahead and get the paperwork for parent affiliate churches in order just to have the paperwork ready so that when the Lord says move forward we ain't got to worry about that loop to jump through we've already jumped through it I'm excited to see what God has for us. Amen. I want to encourage you in this, and I'm praying. You all have a call. You all have a ministry. I asked you last Sunday to spend time in prayer and hear God. Hear the call of God. Again, understand that ministry is not just behind the pulpit. Ministry is making phone calls. Ministry is letting your truck be available, letting your house be available. Ministry is putting your hands to work, doing whatever, teaching a small group, organizing game night, cooking food, just being nice. Opening your homes for different things. That's all ministry. Seek God. And what he would have you to do. And just as Paul didn't back down in a single letter he wrote. He knew who he was. You know who you are. And don't let a devil in hell change your mind about it. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. God we worship you. And we give you glory. Father, again, I pray that you take every word that was spoke tonight. Season it with grace. And apply it to the heart to receive the word, to do the word, to understand that we must move forward through the power of the Holy Spirit and we must do what you've called us to do to understand apostolic function and the full five-fold ministry at work within a healthy church today. 
So, Father, as you lead us in Atlanta and you take us throughout this region and wherever you would have us to go, Father, not my will but thine be done. Flood our eyes with light that we may see and knit our hearts together in unity so that we as a body, a unified faith, would know and understand where you're calling us to go. And for that, Lord, we give you glory and honor. Father, tonight I'd ask that you would put a hedge of protection around each and every one as they travel to and fro. Bless them in their coming and their going, Lord. Father, we just worship you and we thank you for your faithfulness. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. I love you. God bless you. Uh, Don't forget, ladies, spa night, uh, Friday at 6 here at the church. Uh, I don't have much detail, but I know that there will be waxes and face masks and fingernail polish and so yeah Um, I'm gonna be at my house I, uh, I know it's hot but maybe we can